Hello. So uh, on this one, we're gonna continue with uh, disorders of the thyroid. So we're gonna do a, a quick review. Uh, basically it's uh, three drugs that, that we need to see on this chapter. <clears throat> so we'll do an uh, overall review of the diseases and the three medications that I'm gonna be using. So let me share my screen with you. Here it is. And here we go. So uh, the thyroid hormone or the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, these are the, the functions that they have on the body. Uh, one, they control metabolism, basically how fast or how slow the body works, how fast or how slow the body is able to burn calories. <clears throat> and uh, we can see this on, on on kids, teen, especially teenagers, I have one of them, two of them, where they eat, they eat, they eat, and they don't gain weight. They don't seem like they're gaining weight. They have a lot of energy. But then you have me on the other side of the spectrum where I see food and I gain weight. So thyroid hormones, that what they do, they control metabolism, how fast, how slow. Also, uh, they control cardiac function. So the heart, uh, besides uh, epinephrine, uh, T3, T4 can dictate the same thing, how fast the heart will work. And if you notice, I didn't mention how, how slow it was. Uh, the heart, you know, besides being able to be controlled by epinephrine and hormones, also has uh, automicity. That means that it has, the heart is the only organ that can dictate how it's gonna work independent from the body. So thyroid hormones can dictate how fast the heart can go. And also it says here that it has to do with, uh, with growth. Don't confuse this with a uh, growth hormone. That's another hormone, very different. But regarding growth, it means matur maturation. You can see right here, of the central nervous system. A kid that lacks uh, thyroid hormone, the nervous system doesn't develop as well or as someone that has normal amounts, and we'll see some delay in accomplishing milestones. And develop, this one has to do with uh, metabolism, so how fast, how slow <coughs> the body is developing. Now, regarding the thyroid, we mentioned that uh, it makes two hormones, T3 and T4. Uh, basically, T3 means that it has three iodine, and T4, it has four iodines. So the, uh, in order to have a normal function thyroid, we need to have a steady intake of iodine, and the only way to do that is by consuming table salt. Yes. Table salt. Now, uh, let's talk uh, uh, real quick regarding the pathophysiology of uh, the thyroid. So, when the thyroid doesn't make enough T3, T4, it's working below ideal standards. And we'll kind of call that hypothyroidism. And that, depending on, on when it happens, adult kid is going to have a specific name. When it happens on the adult, we're going to call it myxedema. When it, it happens on the, on the infant, we're going to call it pretinism. Now, regarding uh, hyperthyroidism, let's go over here. In the adults, the clinical presentation is a pale, puffy face. Uh, it's, it looks more swollen. We touch them, and they have a cold, uh, dry skin, brittle hair, you know, they lose hair very easily. Heart rate is close to bradycardia. Temperature is low, 97, 96. They're, they're always feeling tired. <clears throat> they don't like the cold because they cannot produce body heat and they have a, a hard time thinking, impair mentality. You know, follow a conversation, a complicated conversation. So it's not something that they enjoy to do because they can't. Now, why? Uh, can this happen? Uh, 
Uh, usually it's uh, diseases. The most common cause, it will be insufficient iodine. If a patient uh, goes to those extreme diets of, of no salt, substitution of table salt, and they forget the iodine. So eventually the thyroid will run out of the storage of iodine that they have and be unable to, to make proper T3, T4. <clears throat> uh, the other one, the uh, lithium, consumption of lithium. We mentioned this in a previous chapter, is used for bipolar disorders. And we have to make sure that the patient has proper amounts of table salt because if not, then lithium will substitute iodine and that's not T3, T4 as it is. So the patient will go into hyperthyroidism. After insufficient iodine is some malfunction of the of thyroid. And this is for uh, infections, sore throat, strep throat, trauma of the neck all that can cause some malfunction of the thyroid. And then after that, it will be autoimmune. So we have these two diseases right here, Hashimoto's disease, or you know, chronic autoimmune thyroiditis. Body attacks the tissue of the thyroid and destroys it. Uh, other reasons for hyperthyroidism, it could be surgical removal of the thyroid or destruction by radiation. This happens when the patient is hyper uh, thyroidism. When the patient is hyper thyroidism, when they have that condition of hyper thyroidism, we need to destroy the thyroid. So from hyper, they go into hypo. And less commonly is because insufficient secretion of hormones to stimulate the thyroid. We're talking about TSH and TRH, thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroid releasing hormone. Now let me go back here a little bit. And this is very important to emphasize. Pregnant patients may go to a hypothyroidism. Not that the pregnancy is the cause, but the patient may be already hypo regarding thyroid functions, and then they get pregnant. And the most common advice to pregnant patients is stop taking your medication. That can hurt the baby. We need to emphasize if the patient already has low function of the thyroid and is taking medications for it and the patient gets pregnant, she needs to continue taking that hormone. Because here we need to emphasize T3, T4 favors the proper development of the central nervous system of the fetus. If for some reason this patient gets scared or the patient goes and asks advice to some, to some of us and we're not aware this is needed for proper fetal development, we're gonna say that it's common advice to pregnant patients. You know what? It's better to avoid drugs during your pregnancy. And if, if we advise that, then the fetus is going to have improper development of the central nervous system. And when that baby is born, it's going to have congenital hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism, where mental retardation, it will be the main part of it. This patient, this baby is going to have a hard time accomplishing regular milestones that we see on pediatric patients. So if the patient is pregnant and they ask you, what should I do? Continue taking your medication unless the doctor does otherwise. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the treatment for hypothyroidism is lifelong. Unfortunately, there's no, hey, you know, take it for a few months and, and that's it. Uh, the treatment is going to be chronic, long-term. So we need to emphasize you need to take your medications on a daily basis, and you have to take it at the same time. All medications that substitute a hormone in our body, that's the advice that you have to give. It has to be on a daily basis, and it has to be at the same time. So we advise during the mornings. You know, with breakfast, take your pill. 
the most common drug use, levothyroxine T4. So like I was telling you, uh, regarding patients that are pregnant and they're hypothyroid, uh, the advice is continue taking your medication or the, the baby will uh, suffer consequences and nervous uh, development, neurological development. <clears throat> before, before we move to, to hyperthyroidism, other advice that you need to tell the patient, don't change the lab, don't change the brand name uh, of the drug. Unfortunately, this is this this hormone is, is very sensitive and then it's not very easy to mimic from one lab to, to another. Yes, the way the, the process, you know, it can be exactly the same. The pill will not provide the same up, outcome from lab to lab. So if for some reason this patient decides, hey, you know what, I'm going to order my medicine from Canada because it's cheaper. You know, if they're here on the border, I'm going to go to Juarez and right over there. They need to let the doctor know so he can be aware that this can be a disadjustment of the drug and he needs to help the patient adjust back to, to the hormone from the new lab that they're getting the medication from. So that will be the advice. Don't change uh, labs. If you change it, please advise your doctor what you're going to be doing so he can help help you get back on regular control of your uh, hyperthyroidism condition. Okay, now let's jump into hyperthyroidism. So here, <clears throat> the most common cause is called Graves' disease. It's an autoimmune disease, just like Hashimoto. But here, even though there's destruction, of the thyroid tissue, uh, grave disease, the, the antibodies goes for the receptors that stimulate the thyroid. So it's funny because the antibodies are destroying the receptor that stimulate, so they're destroying and stimulating at the same time. That's the reason the thyroid starts to act and they behave like hyperthyroidism. Uh, Usually the disease, we're going to see it more common on females between the ages of 20 to 40 years of age. And the highlight is uh, exophthalmus. That means that the eyes, they, they look like they're pushing out. And uh, here, uh, the care that you need, and we don't see it that often anymore. But back in the 1950s, 1960s, the exophthalmus of the patient was so bad that when they go to bed, they couldn't close their eyes. The eyeball was so big that the eyelid couldn't cover it. So they're gonna throw you probably a question on, on the HESI and the anklet regarding how will you take care of a patient that has grave disease and the eyeball is too big that the eyelid doesn't cover it. And that's when you have to, you know, look for an answer that says, you know, we need to provide an ointment to lubricate that part of the eye that is not covered by the eyelid. <clears throat> so this, uh, that's a very tricky question in, uh, regarding exophthalmus. The other one is a toxic nodular goiter. So here the, we have a nodule in the thyroid that makes a big goiter. Goiter means a, a big thyroid. And that nodule is releasing a lot of T3, a lot of T4. So the patient behaves uh, uh, with a, a hyper condition. And then we have one more, ah, thyrotoxic crisis or the thyroid storm. This one's a scary one. It's, uh, it's also hyperthyroidism, but this one, it, ju it just happened. It's, it comes fast. It's a crisis. And usually it's because uh, the patient had a, a very traumatic surgery in the neck area or very severe uh, strep throat. And it just happened all of a sudden, the thyroid start releasing T3, T4 like crazy. And the patients start having tachycardia. They have a uh, have, uh, uh, high temperature, 103, 104, sometimes 105. Uh, they're shaking. They have seizures. The whole body is, is overreacting because it's too much T3, T4 that is being released. 
So how do we treat hyperthyroidism? And it's very simple. We destroy it. Patients with hyperthyroidism need to destroy the thyroid tissue. And that is with radiation followed by surgery. So here we're gonna review the, the other two drugs that uh, belong to, to the chapter. Uh, let me see. So the first drug that we're gonna be talking regarding hyperthyroidism is uh, methimosol, first option for hyperthyroidism. And <clears throat> usually this one takes three to 12 weeks to control the thyroid. L thyroid means a normal thyroid, normal function. E U U means normal. So this medication, methamosol, will take around again three to four weeks. That will be three months more or less to control the thyroid. After this, we do radiation with the surgery to remove the, the tissue. Surgery of the thyroid is never done when the patient has signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Because during the surgery, the thyroid basically will fight back, releasing even more T3, more T4, and that will kill the patient on the surgical table. So when a patient has hyperthyroidism, plan the surgery, and we give methimosal three months as an average, control the thyroid, and then we'll continue with, uh, with the surgery. Uh, another thing regarding methimosal, long-term use, agranulocytosis. We mentioned agranulocytosis in a previous chapter for uh, psychosis. Clonidin, agranulocytosis means no granules. And the white blood cells that have granules is uh, a neutrophil, the basophil. And uh, eosinophil. So those are the three white blood cells they have granules in order to protect us. With methamisol, when it's used long-term, more than three, three months, it's gonna eliminate the granules for, from those white cells and now they cannot do nothing. They're worthless. So question regarding methamisol and the immune system is, a patient that's taken the drug for more than three months and they have a sore throat, what is your next step? has the chills or has a fever or something something that is telling you patient has an infection. You need to advise a doctor to suggest uh, white blood cells. We need to see white blood cells. Evaluate white blood cells because neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils, they are not working. So that's the thing with agranulocytosis. The other drug is uh, PTU, propyl thiracil, PTU. Uh, same thing is to inhibit the production of hormone from thyroid. Second option after methamisole, and the reason that is a uh, second option because this one again use uh, long term can produce liver damage. Same thing uh, when we use PTU is to inhibit the production of a hormone, bring that patient down to a normal thyroid function in order to proceed with surgical uh, thyroid. Same thing, granulocytosis, but it's more severe. And we mentioned the liver damage. Um, okay. Once we have a proper control of the thyroid, we'll continue with uh, radioactive iodine-131. And this one is, uh, is a tablet. 
that we give to a patient, the patient will uh, swallow it. And this radiation, this iodine that is radioactive, eventually is gonna you know, be absorbed by the intestine and belong and be captured in thyroid. <clears throat> and now this uh, radioactive iodine will destroy the tissue of the, of the thyroid, bringing down the levels of T3, T4. Uh, radioactive iodine is used a lot in grave disease. Here on the border, we need to advise the patient. We, we need to provide a doctor's note, uh, a copy of the prescription, something that they're taking radioactive iodine. If this patient decides uh, to go to Juarez and then come back, all the, the alarms, uh, the border patrol will on. I had a friend and it happened to us. Uh, he was taking radioactive iodine. He had this problem of a hyperthyroidism. And uh, I was still a student. I didn't know this. I haven't, I didn't finish. I was still in college. We were still in college. He was a cl classmate of mine. And yeah, we, we went to Juarez, do our stuff, uh, basically buy groceries. Uh, we're on the way back. We're uh, crossing the uh, border. It was our turn to to move in to see the the border patrol. And next thing we know, we start hearing this alarm going on, and the patrol, you know, walks away from the car, and telling us, you know, not to move. Next thing we know, they're coming in in the in the yellow uh, outfits, the little sensor for radiation, and they check the car. And yeah, it's, <laughs> you hear that sound of the car, and you know, they put us to the side and. They're, they're inspecting the car, looking for, I don't know what, a radiation block or something like that. And then they come to us and they tell us, hey, you know that you're radioactive. They check me, there's nothing on me. They check my my buddy and yeah, he's like going crazy on, the, on that machine. And that's when he told him, hey, uh, I'm going to a seizure right now where they're kind of with my thyroid and they give me radioactive iodine but they never told me that I couldn't go to parties or, you know, alarm for stuff like that. So it happens. It happens. It's, it's a nice story after it happens. And then once uh, uh, the radioactive iodine is used, then we proceed with uh, with the surgery. For the surgery, before surgery, we provide uh, a Google solution. Lugo solution is also uh, iodine <clears throat> that uh, suppresses thyroid function. Uh, the adverse effects is when the patient swallows this solution, they're going to, you know, it's going to burn my mouth, burns my throat. Uh, they can complain about their teeth being sensitive afterwards uh, because of the pain, because of the burning. They're going to start drooling. There's a lot of saliva coming. Coming out, they can complain about uh, taste change. You know, they can say, you know, I don't feel tongue normal. So this uh, solution will change the, the perception of taste and tongue. It will increase elevation and stuff like that. Rarely will produce uh, skin eruptions. <clears throat> so will provide this solution and that will be uh, when the surgery is, is coming up. And then surgery happens and now the patient doesn't have a thyroid. So now the patient from being hyper now is hypo. And the treatment for hypo is levothyroxine. So making the, this uh, story short, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroidism, both of them, at the end of the day, they're going to be treated with levothyroxine. Uh, over here, some mention regarding uh, uh, beta blockers. Uh, propanolol, metanolol, anything that ends in LOL, 
And the reason we give beta blockers is to protect the heart in a patient with hyperthyroidism. So patients has a, a hyperthyroidism, we need to provide beta blockers <clears throat> during the prep time or for the surgery, it can be a few months. So we have to make sure that we protect the, the heart, that way the patient doesn't go into tachycardias, supraventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, uh, or any other severe tachycardia that, that may kill the patient. So we'll provide a beta blocker to protect the heart from T3 and T4. Okay, I'll stop sharing. And that's the end of the chapter. See you on the next one.